Uh, the first speaker, Joshua Anderson, is from University of Michigan. He will talk about the uh, the application. I think who MD. Hopefully, I pronounce it right. So, Joshua, please have the floor. All right. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me. So this talk will be uh, a little different than many of the previous ones. There will be no quantum chemistry in this talk. Um, so I'm specifically going to be talking about Python interfaces for molecular dynamics and Monte Carlo particle simulations uh, with Hundi Blue, the code that, that that I've developed over the years. So um, how do I change that? There we go. So uh, Hundi Blue is an open source code, so you can find it on GitHub. And uh, we use it, we develop it out of the Glatzer group at the University of Michigan. And we do s studies of self-assembly on all sorts of different types of systems, ranging from single component quasi-crystals with oscillating pair potentials to two-dimensional plate particles with teeth that can, that can self-assemble together polymers um, for dental applications that form these big micro, micro droplets, um, active matter systems where the particles in the system have some chemical reaction that's driving them to spin or to, to, go, to move forward, or uh, classical um, hard particle self-assembly where you have your, the, the individual particle in the simulation is, a, is an octahedra or a truncated tetrahedra or some other, some other shape and studying how those types of particles self-assemble. Um, so oftentimes, we're, we're, Humdi is focused on coarse grain type simulations um, and coarse grain to the point of where an individual particle in the simulation might, might represent one colloid. So the position and orientation of one colloid is the, the minimum that you can move around in, in that type of simulation. Humdi is also very generic and it can support um, atomistic type MD force fields, um, classical force fields as well. So since this isn't a workshop on HPC, I do have one slide on GPUs. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it. The previous sessions in this workshop have gone into great detail on, on GPUs. I'll just say that GPUs are fast. Um, you should definitely be using them. I built Humdi for GPUs back in 2007. That was a lot of years ago, and uh, they've been great for HPC simulations, uh, MD Monte Carlo ever since. Um, my initial implementations with, with, was with CUDA, obviously, because that was the only thing available at the time. And in version three that we're releasing soon, um, we, have, we have beta releases out now if you want to try it out. Um, we're adding HIP support for AMD GPUs. Um, there are, you know, as you've seen in previous talks, there are many other paradigms you can use to program, whether it's built into the language or M OpenMP or Cocos. And uh, Humdi, we, I don't use those in Humdi for two reasons. One is that we were built for CUDA from the ground up. And two, many of our kernels, we're using, I'm using hand-tuned kernels with, with warp synchronous programming and other tricks to get the absolute most I can out of the GPUs. And the, those types of transformations aren't something that a code generator can do for you. You have to have a lot of knowledge about the algorithm and to program it specifically for the, for the GPU to take advantage of, advantage of that. So there are many, many GPU systems out there ranging from the big boys of um, Summit, um, but there are also you know, smaller systems for, for smaller scale studies, such as the exceed systems in your local cluster. So um, that's, that's pretty much all I have to say about GPUs. The rest of this talk, I'm going to focus more on um, usability of codes. Because to be honest, while GPUs are fast and you can spend years of your life hand tuning a kernel to get another 2% performance boost, um, at the end of the day, if your users can't use the code quickly and efficiently, they can't take advantage of that performance. And many users, both inside and outside our group of Humdi, um, really like the Python interface and for Humdi. And so we've, we've doubled down on that. And with uh, Humdi has always been a Python um, library, uh, to make that clear. But with version three, we're com we've completely redesigned the interface. So 14 years ago, when I started Humdi, 
the norm was, and you know, maybe many of you in this talk, the norm still is for you, sort of a declarative syntax where you define in a text file, you define what your simulation is going to do and you feed that to an executable and it processes that text file and, and takes those steps. Um, but Humdi has always been a Python interface and I sort of modeled the original Python interface after those more declarative syntaxes. And the modern grad student just coming in learning Python knows things now that they didn't know 14 years ago, like object oriented programming. They, they know and they expect and they want to combine um, their simulation engine with analysis, with SciPy, with TensorFlow, with, with, with things like that. And so in version three, we've, we've turned the API around and we've designed it from the ground up with an object oriented format. So if you're familiar at all with, with MD or Monte Carlo um, simulations, they're a time stepping based uh, solution to, to basically find configurations that minimize free energy, like this little animation I have here of octahedra self-assembling from a random initial configuration into a ordered lattice here in this last frame. Um, and the way Humdi now, Humdi 3 will expose, exposes this to the user is through a, an object-oriented API. So there's a simulation class that drives an entire simulation, a device that you can describe whether you're running on a CPU or GPU or um, options for those devices, a state that stores the positions, orientations, velocities, angular momenta, et cetera, of all the particles in the system, and then operations that you apply to activate your simulation. And so these aren't specific to MD and MC. This is the integrator um, for this little code snippet that I have on the right here is shows a, a Monte Carlo simulation, uh, the same one in the mo movie above. And here the, the integrator that moves things forward in time is a uh, Monte Carlo integrator that applies trial moves to particles. You could swap this out for um, a molecular dynamics integrator that integrates the equations of motion forward in time similarly. There are other types of objects you can apply that update the system state. For example, if you want to compress the system, writers allow you to do things like write out, write out a trajectory file to make animations or to post-process analyze, do post-process analysis. And then there are, there are tuner objects that can tune the performance of the simulation. Now, there are parameters in MD um, and Monte Carlo that don't affect the correctness of the simulation, but they can affect the performance quite a bit. So the architecture of this is um, um, starting from the bottom. You know, we're running on hardware somewhere, and uh, Humdi is using CUDA and MPI to do that. That's all from a C plus plus um, a C plus plus library and uh, written that way for performance. And that exposes Python hooks. To, that are used in the Python library, which provides that high level clean interface I showed you on the example on the last slide. So the user's Python script has this high level clean interface and it creates objects that at the end of the day are running in CUDA on the hardware and communicating across multiple nodes with MPI. But this all interoperates with other Python tools in the scientific Python ecosystem, such as Matplotlib, SciPy, for example, I'm just naming two that are really popular. It could be um, others. There are two other tools developed in our group, Sinyak and Freud, which if I have time at the end, I'll, I'll give a brief advertisement for, um, which may or, you know, Sinyak is a pure Python library. Freud is, is also has a C++ library back end, and you can communicate with these um, efficiently, which I'll talk about on this slide. So one of the ways in, in the V3 API that we're really improving integrations with this, this ecosystem is by adding a zero copy access to the state data. So this is, there's a variety of means for this. You can use NumPy or there's this CUDA rate interface protocol and there's some other competing protocols out there. It's, it's not obvious at this time, which one is going to win out to be the most, um, most supported by packages. But what, at, at the root of it, what these interfaces allow you to do is whom do you C++ code can take a pointer to a, an array of numbers um, say the particle positions, for example, and it can expose that to Python as a NumPy array. So it's it's not copying the data. It's just taking the pointer, putting it into a NumPy array and telling, okay, here, Python, here's an object that looks like a NumPy array, talks like a NumPy array, but it's really data that I own. And so through this zero, it's a zero copy infrastructure, that NumPy array could then be passed to another Python library 
that knows how to access NumPy arrays efficiently and can use that data directly from Hundi's own memory buffer without copying. And you can use this, um, for example, I've got a very high level example in code here of creating a custom action. So normally, if you wanted to modify Hundi to implement a new algorithm, let's say you wanted a, a new force on your particles. Um, if you wanted to be performant, you'd have to write it in C++, and many students find that to be a very high energy barrier and would take a lot of work. And if you don't even know if the force is, is going to be scientifically useful for you, you don't want to invest that time. Um, but most students at the same time are happy to write Python code and to, to, you, to use NumPy to do these types of things. So with these custom actions now and the zero copy memory access pattern, you could prototype a, a new force in Python, try it out. Maybe it, it's not going to run in, as, as fast as it would if you did it natively in C++, but you'll get reasonable performance out of it. And you'll be able to get some, some answers pretty quickly. And if, if you just need one simulation, you're done, you're fine. But if you're then going to move on and run tens of thousands of simulations like this, um, maybe you think about writing in C++. But, um, yeah, that's all I want to say on that. Um, any simulation engine needs to provide loggable quantities, things like the potential energy or uh, kinetic temperature, other, other things like that. And uh, Humdi's new logging infrastructure is, a, is an object-oriented system for that. It doesn't define a fixed formatted file that you have to use. It just provides properties, uh, for example, this thermodynamic quantities dot kinetic temperature. Um, that you can just access directly. So if you're using Humdi as a Python API, you don't even need to interact or go through a log file to get average average energies. You could just access them directly from, from the interface. At the same time, if you want to log them to a file um, for post-processing, you certainly can do that. And there's there's we have some classes to facilitate that. Um, we have a, some binary or, uh, file formats that you can save these to, and these are a big advantage for array data. Um, many simulation engines, you can, you can log scalar quantities very easily, but let's say if you wanted to log the energy per particle, um, that might not be so easy to do. But with Hundi B3, you can just, you can drop that into the trajectory output file. Um, tools like Ovito will load that in and make it available as that you can use to then say color your particles by by energy or draw force vectors on top of your particles or anything like that. Um, tremendous, tremendous. This is tremendously useful for um, all sorts of analysis, post processing analysis. Um, Humdi integrates with tools developed by MoStuf. Uh, this is a uh, big multi university NSF project that is uh, developing Python tools centered around reproducible simulations with atomistic and coarse grain force fields. So there's a several um, tools in this, in this suite. Um, mbuild is one of them. It allows you to, in Python code, define hierarchical components that you connect together. So this, this little graphic here, which I borrowed from the mbuilds webpage, um, shows a little substrate, a substrate, and some monomers and polymer units that you tie together, um, and then you can attach those. Um, you can graph those onto the substrate. Um, so the this is the the key thing about this is this is there's no GUI here. You're not clicking and dragging to put thing to build this. You're you're writing Python rules to combine compound classes together to create this at the end. And so you can put parameters in there. You can change the density on the substrate as a parameter, or you could change which end groups are on your poly polymers or the, the, the composition of the substrate. And anything that you can change in code, you could parameterize and use for uh, the classic example is to use this for high throughput screening studies, where you're going to run thousands of simulations of different, different models to, to look at how they behave and, um, and find the optimal, for example. That couples with a tool called FOIR, which is a way of atom typing systems in a, and you describe the, of the rules for atom typing in a generic way in an XML file using smile strings. So this is, um, allows you to make your force field reproducible because it's one file that describes the, the atom types and the, and the force field parameters 
rather than being tied to say a specific version of Gromax and a specific force field that's only implemented within Gromax, you can describe it in this way. And you can, you can use those tools in combination with, with a number of simulation engines I've listed here at the bottom, Gromax, LAMPS, HUMD, CP2K, and, and others. Um, and we're adding more um, over time. Um, for using it with HUMD specifically, I've got a little code snippet here that fits really nicely into this object-oriented scheme where mbuild and foyer together can call a, a, of a method called create HUMD force field, where you give it the foyer XML and your mbuild compound, and it returns a list of forces that you can then pass into um, uh, HUMD's NVT or MD integrator here with the, the line at the bottom, integrator.forces equals force field. And the, that force field is just a list of force objects in HUMD that, should, that implement the Leonard Jones and charge and bond and, and angle terms that are part of that force field. So we're, we're hoping this, this project um, can set, set some new standards for reproducibility in the field. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about software engineering. Uh, I was mentioned in some of the first talks in this, this workshop that, that the engineering and the way you build your code is really important um, and that you can not only give your community uh, a good, do a favor for a community by doing this well, but also a favor for your future self when, when you come back to, to maintain your own code 10 years from now, um, you'll appreciate it. So Humdi has always had strong unit testing. Um, but over the years, I have evolved the frameworks we're using to uh, stay with the most uh, convenient ones. Right now, that's PyTest. Um, that is the best uh, best framework for, for doing unit tests for Python applications, in my opinion. Um, one of the really convenient excuse me, features of PyTest is it has frameworks that allow you to run the same test with different parameters. So for example, in Humdi, I use this to run the same tests on both the CPU and the GPU with and without MPI and things like that. Um, CI is another uh, handy way to make sure that these tests are run uh, quite often. And this is another rapidly evolving space. Uh, I have used Jenkins, I've used Circle CI, I've used Azure Pipelines. My current favorite is GitHub Actions, but um, they're inventing new CI systems very quickly, so this might not last for long, but GitHub Actions is pretty nice right now. None of those CI systems, um, not, at least none of the cloud-based ones, give you free time on GPUs. So to test the GPU code, um, I do use the self-hosted GPU runners. And however, uh, these CI tests run when you do, when whenever developers submit pull requests and every time a new commit hits a pull request. And pull request reviewers and developers want as rapid a turnaround time as possible. Right now for HUMD, that's about a little over an hour to complete a full test suite. And at the same time, if you want to do a really strict validation test, for example, take a Leonard Jones fluid at a known density and um, temperature and ensure that you're getting the, the average energy. Make sure that the equation of state, you're able to get the correct equation of state with an MD simulation. That's really not possible to run in a few minutes. Uh, you can try and make it happen, but it, you just can't really get enough reliable sampling and equilibrate the system in that amount of time. So I do have a separate repository where we run longer running validation tests on HPC resources. Um, the disadvantage is that it's not automatic. The, the convenience of the CI platforms is it just happens automatically and you never forget it. You get a nice little satisfying green check mark when everything works out. Um, but these, these one-off validation tests, someone has to remember to run them um, and make it part of the release checklist or something to make sure that it gets done at least before new releases. As I mentioned, Humdi is open source. Uh, it's, a, it's a very large project, uh, hundreds of thousands of lines of code. Um, many, many features in it have been made possible and contributed by open source contributions from outside of our group. Um, and specifically, 99 people have contributed over the years. Um, we use the standard pull request model, and I think this community is pretty familiar with that by now. I do package HUMD to make it easy to use for, um, for, for everyone who wants to use it. So Conda is a really nice system for packaging Python uh, binaries. Um, it has a very 
very well defined and strict ABI so that all the packages, or Conda Forge specifically, has a very well defined and strict ABI such that all packages built on Conda Forge will, will play nice with each other. That's not true of all Python packages in general. Um, so you can install HMD from Conda Forge in this way. Um, on HPC systems, um, the disadvantage with Conda is that HPC systems have specialized MPI installations. And if you want to take advantage of the fast networks and MPI, uh, the schedulers on those systems, you really need to be using their native MPI um, implementations, which means you either have to build from source or the next best thing is to use a container. So I publish uh, singularity images that include HMD and many other Python tools commonly used with HMD. And you can uh, you can pull these all, all all the main HPC systems except for Summit uh, for security reasons uh, do support Singularity, and this you get with which is one command. Not only do you get HMD, but you also get most of the tools that that you would want to use with it. Um, for for cloud applications, Docker images. Um, in, in in fact, I, I publish the Docker Docker images first, and Singularity is just a conversion from that Docker image. All the releases, I, I, I try to, the release process can get a bit time consuming if you do everything manually. So this, I script it all with CI to, to keep the time requirements down. I do have a couple minutes here before questions. So I do, uh, we'll take a time to go over this slide. So uh, of all of the other tools that Glotzer Group develops, uh, Syniac is another one that, that you might find interesting. Um, this is not specific to MD and MC simulations. It's a generic data and workflow management tool. So everyone has uh, at some point created different directories and, and come up with the naming schemes to have a directory structure for naming the temperature of the simulation and the density and et cetera, all the different parameters you have. Um, Syniac automates that where you, you don't have to come up with a directory structure yourself. You just describe the parameters in a diction in a Python dictionary, and then it uses a hash to create the directory. This allows you to quickly go back, to quickly iterate what all um, simulations you run. It allows you to add new ones. If you choose to change your schema, um, you can change your schema and the directories just get renamed. And that's, that's fine. As you go through a research process, you discover that you need to add new parameters and rerun rerun simulations at, at different parameters and keep keep some existing existing simulations. This couples with a, a, a package called Syniac Flow that can describe a workflow. So you can can describe different steps in the workflow, generating generating an input configuration, equilibrating that, processing the data and analyzing it, all as independent workflow steps. Each workflow step is it can most convenient if you're working in Python, it's most convenient just to write it as a Python function. If you're not working in Python, if you have a command line tool, that's fine too. Flow can flow can handle um, command line tool invocation for any of these steps. And at the end of the day, what you end up with is I have these three lines of code, Python init.py, Python project.py run, Python project.py submit. These these lines of code can can reproduce an entire simulation study where if init.py describes all the simulations you're going to execute and project.py describes all the different workflow steps to run on those, then um, the first, first run can, can run all the initialization steps and then the submit can generate job scripts to run on your cluster where that cluster may be summit, it might be an exceed system, it could be a local cluster. And then that would submit the job scripts to, to run all those jobs. So this allows you to be in um, I have this, this tagline, true, transparent, re reproducible, usable by others, and extensible, um, which was coined in this uh, paper citation at the bottom, uh, allows you to be very reproducible in, your, uh, in what your study is. You can share these scripts with the community after you publish your paper. Um, or, or with your coworkers while you're working on the paper and make it clear what, what you're running. You can make it easy to rerun those on any other system. And extend, the big thing, I, I like to emphasize the extensibility. If someone wants to extend your study and look at 
new state points or use a different simulation method in, uh, instead. You can take this these scripts as a starting point, modify them to extend that and, and go with it. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, NSF for, for funding this work and all the members of the Glotzer Lab for working on this. Um, and I'll take any questions. Thanks, Joshua. So any questions from the audience? Oh, uh, Henry has hands up. Go ahead, unmute yourself. I don't have a question. I was just uploading. Oh, uh, I do have a couple of questions. Well, maybe start with a simple one, for example. Uh, sure. So you have the hip port for AMD. Do you keep separate CUDA and hip source code, or you just get all hip code? We so we converted to all hip code, except in cases where we're using features that hip doesn't implement. And in those cases, we use uh, compiler preprocessor definitions and just use CUDA code there. So there's a few features in HMD that you can't use on, on hip. So you don't have uh, sustainability concerns about hip not supporting CUDA to maybe at certain point in the future? Well, we have, we, I have, I have concerns about HIP in general. I find HIP to be a very poorly documented uh, library. I have run into a numerous compiler bugs that it, it causes. Um, and so to be honest, uh, before we release V3, I'm actually going to convert and I'm going to put another layer on top of HIP. So I'm going to have my own, um, de developed by a, a Humdi, another Humdi developer, our own um, header layer that translates from our code to CUDA, so we can use CUDA directly when we compile for CUDA, or from our code to HIP, so that we can use HIP when we want to build for AMD chips, just to keep HIP out of the loop as much as possible, because I, I, it's it's challenging to work with. Um, the, my, my second question will be on the Python interface you introduced, do you share your experience, which is really nice to, uh, yeah, have us understanding how to add this layer. Uh, my question is about, uh, so in other applications, they tend towards to have some uh, use Python, but generate the text input as usual uh, to feed to the, the usual pipeline of uh, IO. I think their motivation would be uh, not maintaining two sets of APIs towards the the the, the, the library uh, to to the, the package, so there are different pros and cons. I think you could uh, mention about your thinking about why you, uh, yeah, didn't. Yeah, absolutely. No, no, and 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 to be honest, right? If I go back to the, where's my most stuff slide? This most stuff slide, right? Many of these support like the support for Cassandra and the support for. Um, NAMD and, and Gromax, right? This is a Python tool that's writing the Gromax text file that you then submit to run with Gromax. So many, um, even people I collaborate with are doing this and they're doing it because that's, that's the only format that that engine accepts. So uh, as to why, why I like the pure Python API approach, um, is because it's so composable, right? We saw this with the Sci4 presentation, right? Look at look at all that Sci4 and QC archive and, and and the database and everything they were able to pull off by having a nice um, clean Python API to work from and and what you can build from that. So things that that people are building with Humdi's Python API, it, you know, Humdi doesn't have any built-in support for metadynamics or for um, umbrella sampling or things like that. Um, but with just, I mean, umbrella samples is actually pretty simple. If you, with just a few lines of Python code calling the Humdi API in the right way, you can implement umbrella sampling. And so users can, can build on top of this API and build their own really complex workflows, things that just aren't possible with, um, a text file driven command line tool, um, where you can actually get in and control and run run 10 time steps, check the state of the system and make a decision of whether to, to do something else or to continue running. 
um, you can't you can't restart um, a command line engine and, and change its text file after every ten time steps. It's just it's not a people do it right. Absolutely, people do it. Um, it's but it's not as efficient and it's not as clean as working with a pure Python implementation. Uh, another thing you can do with this is without needing any special C++ code, you could couple Humd with PyTorch or TensorFlow and do machine learning on system configurations or use it to, to implement a force field um, all within Python, right? Those tools all have Python interfaces. You can, you can do things like that. You can couple analysis and simulation directly. So if you have some, some, some order parameter that you want to do compute autocorrelation functions of, right? And auto, typically with those, you would need to do this every 10 time steps or something really, really fast to get good statistics. You can't reasonably save that much data for post-processing, but you could just drop in a couple of lines of Python code to call out and um, compute this order parameter and then do the autocorrelation function all within a running simulation and compute it online. Those are those are a few examples of things that that are just just fall out naturally when you have a, a full Python interface. Let's see, I can think of one more. Oh, um, combining Monte Carlo and MD. If you yeah. want to run run Monte Carlo with uh, let's say Gibbs ensemble insertion rules for a while to equilibrate a uh, equilibrate a system and then continue on with MD to look at the dynamics of a system and then swap back and forth. That, that's something you can naturally do if, if both of those engines have Python interfaces. Yeah. Thanks. So yeah, uh, much appreciate. I think uh, uh, oh, it sounds so e it sounds easy to have those interface working well, but there's tremendous effort developers yeah. have to put to get all the absolutely right absolutely it's this thank is the, yeah. it's not easy to design a good a good api <laughs> thank you for the uh answer so uh it's time for the next